nice thing about doing a series is you can kind of mess around with it. So if you're expecting Haggai, he's in here, he's in, he's in it, he's in, he's kind of, I'll refer to him just because that's in the series, but we really only managed half of, half of Gideon, really, it's not enough of Gideon, to be honest. I feel what the, a few things, the Holy Spirit, why, why I'm doing this series is fundamentally that, <clears throat> and I'd really urge you, if you didn't hear the first one about bringing the ark to the, back to the center, into the center of David's life and, that, and the challenge of doing that. Uh, this on Gideon, I'm going to talk about uh, Caleb and Joshua. And I'm telling the stories from the Bible, but the reason I'm doing it is because I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to, to partner with his story for us as a community. And we all have a story that we're figuring out. We'll have, we'll have either someone will have told us one or we'll be feeling one or we'll have invented one because we'll have a story about Hope Church and its, its story and its arc and its past, its present and its future, right? The most important story of all is heaven's opinion, not ours. Would you agree with that, guys? Yeah. And, and so I really feel these stories are because he wants, these are what I'm talking to you about. If you get nothing else out of this series that, that I'm doing, is that you, you allow yourself to be caught up with his version of the story of which he has for us. All right, and and we've been on a journey, but it's not over, and it's not always been easy. But that doesn't mean there's not a greater purpose in the whole thing. And these stories, over and over again, illustrate that: what happened with David, what happened with Gideon, what happened with Caleb. And I want us to dial into that because that's I want to know the Father's heart for us and Heaven's opinion. And live that story, not what somebody else maybe came up with or I cooked up on my own. Because we're story people because we're meaning people. You will be having a story going on in your heart and your head. Uh, because that's kind of how we live. And, and we, live in a, we live in a world where the story, the big picture story, has been demolished and fragmented. So we had a world in which, broadly speaking, the Christian story of God the Creator the creation, the fall, the redemption in Jesus and a, and, a, and a glorious future of a new heaven and a new earth actually shaped Western culture and that's been pretty much taken to bits and we're now living in the horrible result of that where there is no story and where there is no story, there is no meaning. And we're in, I've been reading quite a lot about this, we're in a meaning crisis and I think too many believers have got sucked into the meaning crisis. What am I here for? What am I supposed to do? Who am I? Where am I going? Listen, it's so important that you remember the big story, but also that you plug into his story. That you're part of a story. You're part of a God doing something with a community. You're actually part of that. Without you, it won't be as good as it would be with you. Without your participation, your energy, your, all the things we talk about, it's not going to happen quite as well as it would with you. And, and, and I, I just want us to sort of hear that. I believe that's his heartbeat, is that he catches us up afresh in his story for us so that there's actually meaning to what we do every day. Every day there's meaning to what we do for him. All right? We're not living in a soup. We're not living in a meaningless universe where we're just trying to get through, pay the bills, raise the kids the best we can, and you know, keep our head down and on we go. Because that's kind of where Gideon, Gideon's people were at. They had been in trouble for seven years. Hopefully you've read these by now because there probably won't be time to read all the pa passages. But Gideon and Israel had been in hiding in caves because for seven years the Midianites had been coming. Every time they had a harvest, they would raid them. So they were living on meager rations. They were, they were, they were overcome by these opponents and were living in hiding, in oppression, in lack, in discouragement. They were in defeat. They were seven years of it and you start to become 
many, many of them were just resigned to this is how it is. And they were just trying to get through. And, but, but Gideon was a strange old guy, as we talked about last week, because he's attempting to thresh out wheat in a wine press, which is a bit of a futile act, because the whole point is you thresh wheat in the open air so that the breeze can blow away the chaff. That's not going to happen in a wine press. But bless the guy, he's having a crack. Um, so all the defeats and all the discouragements and the lacks Ha, the result in the heart of Gideon wasn't resignation but something else. All right? And I think it's really important that if you have a season in your life or a season in your community or a season in your family that's long term discouraging, that you don't end up in resignation. But you at least have a crack in the wine press. All right? That's, that's the spirit of Gideon. I think he's not given up. Too many believers give up. They look at what's happening in culture, they look at what's happened to the Western church, they look at COVID and wars and they're like, I'm just, it's just too much, there is no hope, I'm just going to kind of do my best to do my life how I can do my life. And they're not entering into a possibility that it could be different with God. And there is, I mean, there is a story out there that you know, Christianity is dying. It, it's not actually true. Actually, Christianity is growing around the world faster than there are people being born by a level of two to one. It's 2.6 billion believers on the planet, I think, currently, and growing fast. Just because it's not happening maybe in people's slice of the world in the way they think it should. So let's not, let's not buy the media story. Let's not, let's not buy even sort of people, other people's story. Let's, let's get heaven's story for us and find fresh meaning for what we're doing right here. And what you're doing tomorrow. Because we're, me we're meaning machines. We, we look for meaning in all sorts of stuff. You know, some people on the extreme end, you know, oh, the clock... I woke up and it was 5.15. And then the next day I woke up and it was 5.15 again. That must mean something. And that's fine. Not everybody's wired like that, but do you see what I mean? There's that kind of, we're looking for meaning or something. But the meaning you find is governed by the story that you're living in. You know, the meaning could be, look up Romans 5.15. The meaning could be, he wants you to get up earlier every day. Or the meaning could be you need a new alarm clock. <laughs> Depends the story you're attaching to the event, all right? So, so here's good old Gideon, and he's, I just want to recap a little bit. Uh, because really last time we just looked at how God loves to use people who don't think they're much and don't have much, which is where he was at. He thought he was an are not and a have not. You know, the least of the least, etc. But God loves to pick people like that. So if you think, you know, I'm not up to much, you're qualified. <laughs> you're in. You know, you and but but he has this way of speaking to us, and he speaks to us like he sees us, not how we see ourselves. And I, I've experienced that in my life and seen it in others. You can miss what he's saying because you're like, that can't be for me. It must be must be some other Andy Merrick, bigger and larger and grander and better somewhere else that he's saying that to, because that's t way too important. But no, he says, hey, God is with you, mighty warrior. God is with you, mighty warrior. Yeah, but, you know, I've been stuck in this spot for years. No, God is with you, mighty warrior. That's how he sees you. And as we get involved in his story, which is his version of reality, and allow it to become ours, guess what? We start to change. And it's not because us believing it makes it true. Well, if I just believe it enough, then I can get out of the hole I'm in, and then, then it will be true because I've believed it. No, 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 no. The truth is you're a mighty warrior. And by believing it, you start to partake in what is already, that is reality. 
Hello? That, that is reality, it's not, and it's not rooted in how we're feeling about reality or even how we've thought about reality in the past. It's rooted in his reality, which is ultimate reality. I was really moved listening to Bill this week. I'm like, oh. For years I listened to Bill Johnson. I used to drive to New Frontiers Leaders Conferences, which were okay, but my delight was listening to Bill Johnson in the car because I'd cry all the way to the conference just hearing not because the message was bad I was just encountering the heart of the father in a whole way it was like it was so good I'd stop for coffee put it back on oh god you're so amazing you're so amazing so he, Bill was doing that to me again this week huh not while I was driving thankfully but you know it's not a full-on ugly cry when I was driving but you know tears would trickle down my face because it wasn't dangerous <laughs> just to reassure you it wasn't dangerous. And you know that the reality is the presence of the unseen Holy Spirit is actually better for us than having the seen presence of the physical Jesus in the room. That's God's value system at work right there. Because he actually says, I'm going away and it's better. He says, it's better that I'm going because I'll send the Holy Spirit. And the one who's been with you will be in you. It's hard to compute that, isn't it? If we are honest. Like who who let's just be honest, gang. You know, if Jesus himself walked in through the door, we're like, oh, all bets are off, all problems are over. Uh, the victory is ours, we know what we're doing, we can ask him any question we want. Uh, suddenly we're we're rescued. We're we're on the right track. We're any you know what I mean? Yeah, we could go and sit there. come 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 to Weatherspoons for lunch, Jesus. We have so many questions, you know. And uh, how is the worship? What do you think of worship? What about these guys? Do you think they did okay, Jesus? Yeah, uh, who knows what we'd be asking him, you know? And if he was joining in and enjoying it, we'd be like, Jesus is here and he loves us. Yeah, it's better that the Holy Spirit is here. He's doing all that and more, although right now, although we can't see him with these, with we, we were on this morning. You could feel you could that feeling thing, that spiritual sensitivity. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's better than you can ask, still ask him all the questions. Like, what do you think of Dave Mummery leading worship? Holy Spirit, were you were you in in on that? I, I know what he's going to say. I think he absolutely loved it. What a band. So you, he's with us, which is Haggai. The message of Haggai, two chapters summed up, God is with you. God is with you, and that was enough. That was enough when that clocked that God was with them. Suddenly, that whole community arose and started to rebuild the temple. That one, I mean, Haggai is not a profound, exegetical preacher. He just says, God is with you, and they rose and built. Because that's the thing you really need to know, and that's what God is saying to Gideon is, this is my opinion of you, you're a mighty warrior, and I am with you. That's enough. Um, <laughs> so let's not give in to resignation. But let setbacks create hunger rather than resignation. Gideon's life changes on an encounter. And I'm convinced God wants to give every single one of us in Hope Church a fresh encounter with him in the first part of this year. Not because that will be it and over, but because he wants to remind you of who you are, like he's doing with Gideon, re-empower you, re-envision you, and introduce you to the life of the future that he's got for you, which is basically one of continuous encounter. So old covenant is God shows up, God seems to go away, but new covenant is he's with you all the time and he's in you. So the level of intimacy, experience, and encounter we can live in is actually continuous. The ones that we have that are special are to kick us on a bit, to raise us up a bit, to make us aware a bit more, Rather than that, oh, that was it. That was nice. Ten years ago, that I've had my my thing, had my shot, got my jags from the Holy Spirit. 
It's not like that. So he wants to reintroduce you to himself. Whatever level you've had, there is another, there's another level to go. There's cones are being kicked over all over the room. He's coming to flood in to you. And these encounters tell you who you really are. And it's to move you on. To do something beyond your human capability. If everything you plan to do in your life, you know you can do it. If you just earn enough money, if you just think hard enough, if you just work hard enough, if you plan better, well enough, you're going to make it happen, then really you don't have to be a Christian to do that. But actually we're called to be partnering with him. So what, what happens to Gideon He's given an impossible mission. All right? This isn't, this is a ridiculous idea that this guy could lead Israel to freedom from the Midianites. It's bonkers. Has God ever said anything bonkers to you? Really, like bonkers. Believe it. If it's bonkers, it's probably him. And not only is it bonkers, but it's bigger, larger, and absolutely outside anything he could pull off with his own skill set and his own resources, which is one of his arguments. He's like, I'm the least family. I'm, 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 I'm the run to the litter. It's, what he's saying is we don't have any clout in this community and we don't have any resources because we're the least of the least. And God says, I've got the solution to all of that. Do you know the story? I'm, you know, I'm looking at... So he does a bunch of stuff and basically 32,000 show up to be his army and you're like, woohoo, 32,000, come on, that's, that's church growth. It's like, it's kind of awesome in very short space of time. Uh, the problem is if you have to read on to chapter 8, but you can figure out that it's, it's a swarm like a multitude. It talks about a chapter 8, you figure out there's probably... What's coming against them is 135,000 Midianites. So, you know, do the maths. 135,000 over the hill somewhere coming to do war, and there's 32,000. So suddenly, it's not feeling so cool, is it? 32,000, you know, there's only one guy in a wine press, 32,000. He's going to be encouraged with that until you see the odds. <laughs> See, he loves to use the small against the odds to show his glory. That's the, see, the goal isn't just can we get it done. The goal is can God be shown for how amazing he is. And, uh, and so he gets the 32,000. God says, that's too many. That's too many. We need less. Because if you win with 32,000, you'll think it was your strength, and I don't want you to have that. That's, that's not what I want you to think. Tell everybody who's afraid to go home. Now, at this point, the leader, Gideon, all right, I'm, I'm thinking, when I read this, with, I read it in two ways. I read it like as a leader. So sometimes I'm in Gideon's shoes, and I'm thinking, crap, I'm scared, I'm going home. <laughs> but the leader doesn't get to go home. But everybody else gets to go home. And you're like, well, I'm scared and I'm still here. And now I've got less than I had before. What are you doing, God? That's, that's a kind of Andy Merrick conversation. And, uh, and God's like, yeah, but, yeah, okay, yeah, but you've still got 10,000. That's too many for me to get glory through the victory I'm going to give. And you're like, too many? <laughs> What I want you to do, Gideon, is get Gideon is get them all take a drink, and uh, and I'll, I'll I'm gonna I'm gonna whittle it down. Out of ten thousand people, only three hundred drink the way God wants them to drink. I mean, if I was Gideon, I'd be going, "Hey, God, you remember that deal about the scared people could go away? Can I go now?" Because <laughs> All the ones that kneel down and put their heads in the water, God says, I don't want them. I only want the ones that cup and... And I wonder if that's because they're actually staying more alert. You know, there's a 130,000 plus enemy over there. And here you've got... 
9,700 people just burying their faces in the water, but 300 are like, we've got a job here, we've got to keep our heads up, God says, I'll have them. We should never judge our chances of success by how many we are. If we do, we'll go home and miss something amazing. And I think that's kind of happened around the church in the UK. Obviously, I'm in touch with UK churches, and some are doing well, some are, but it's like, oh, this is just too difficult. I'm going to go home. They're going to miss something amazing. Because Jesus rose from the dead. He wasn't just crucified. How are we doing? So he doesn't need lots to do a lot. Um, I want to give you two stories. One very kind of current and personal to me is he keeps, we've got this thing called Kingdom Legacy and he keeps talking to me about leading it and it's, 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 it's a bit bonkers. Like I lead now a relatively small church in Scotland and God keeps saying to me, uh, I want you to lead this national slash international movement. It really is like a Gideon thing. It's like, <laughs> You've got the wrong guy here. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't have the resources. I don't have the profile. I don't have. I don't have. I don't have. And he's like, I'm not. I'm not persuaded by any of your don't haves. Uh, I am not. Don't haves. Don't add up. And he just keeps bringing more people in the door, so to speak. That, so we've got like 50 leaders. We're into. Got invited to South Africa. They, want, want, they really want us back in India. Bless. John, John uh, Dury out there, got, there's about 14 churches out there and he wants us to train their leaders and uh, we've got a guy on from Australia, someone else is connecting from New Zealand and, 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 and then we've got people from basically from Brighton all the way up to Aviemore in, in the UK and churches joining, leaders joining. Right, we better get sorted with this. This is a serious thing. But who, who? I wouldn't do. I wouldn't birth that from where we are. But we've done it, guys. It's happening, and it wouldn't have happened without you, because we wouldn't be here without you, and we wouldn't have been part of this family and everything we've learned. And now, back in 2013, you all said, "Yes, you're released to me and Teresa," and we've tried to work that out over the last quite a few years, isn't it? Eleven years. And then when Seth and Jeff came the first time, Seth, we were whacked out on the floor and up there because you're called to spearhead a movement. Like, whoa. These are kind of Gideon moments when you're like on the floor thinking, have you really got the right person? Yes, you're the right person. So you have to keep going, it's me. It looks bonkers. I don't feel up to it. I don't have the resources. It's me. I know you're talking to me, not some other guy. I'm not an imposter. This is the real me. I am this awesome apostolic leader, and somebody needs to do this job for our nation. I'm in. Amen. I am. I'm in. Trees is in. And then you have another moment you're like, which is why you're going to get the Caleb story. It's like, I have got two kids in their 40s. You are bonkers. You call people that are younger than me to do this. You know what I'm saying? Keeps reminding me of a friend of mine. Do you remember we used to go to Paris Church, Gordon Neal? He retired from a very high profile job in Nestle, Gordon Neal. To and at his retirement, God came into his room, appeared to him, and basically said, I want you to par- plant a church in Paris. He's retiring. So bless his heart, he did it. And for about seven years he did that, and there's a, actually a good, healthy church there in Paris because God called him in his retirement to do something. So I'm like, darn, that's that argument out the window as well, isn't it? And then I'm listening to uh, David Hogan. Uh, if you've come across him, he's a crazy guy, just a crazy, crazy guy. But he leads this incredible thing in Mexico. And he's there and he says, I'm 72 years old. And I've run 60 marathons. And we just had two absolutely terrible years in our ministry. And then this year has been the best ever. We've planted over 300 churches. We're losing count. People are getting raised from the dead. And you're like, whoo, how old was he again? 72. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's that one out the window as well, isn't it? So 
So this is real for me. This is real for us. Hmm. Do you know that yesterday was the 30th anniversary of the Toronto blessing outpouring at the start of it? It started on the 20th of January, 1994. You, it might be, most of you were born then, but probably most of you are pretty young. I actually went. September 94, I went to Toronto, got whacked and lay on the floor. Um, you know that, that it started on a Thursday night. There was 120 people in the room. And God showed up. Within a year, 7,000 churches in the US and the UK had been affected. Within 10 years, Heidi Baker, probably who arrived at one of those meetings, having planted two and a bit churches in Mozambique, burned out, ready to get a job at Kmart, she says, completely just, just exhausted. God meets with her 10 years later, so, sorry, 20 years later, there's 10,000 churches. Now there's more than 11,000 churches that, that, that she has planted. Uh, che Aunt, thousands of churches, people like Bill Johnson, who you know of, da 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 all that out of 120 people on a Thursday night showed, bothered to show up to a renewal meeting. That's happened in, in most of our lifetime. That has actually happened. And it's still the fruit of that is still taking place. So being small and showing up counts, guys. It totally counts. And... Uh, <laughs> So Gideon's knocked down to 300. And God says, you've got to read it. it just, God's got a sense of humor. He's like, if you're scared. So finally, Gideon gets to have a conversation about being scared with the Lord, whereas he's had to release everybody else. If you're scared, go down and have a listen to the enemy's camp. So he goes down and the, he's having a listen Sometimes God lets you listen to what the enemy is saying. And when I was prepping this a few weeks ago, I said, Lord, what's the enemy saying about Hope Church? I had to listen. And you know what? I'd like to swear because they are scared witless of us as we get our act together and realize who we are. They are absolutely wetting themselves. That's probably about as crude as I can make it, but that's what I saw. For you guys. So he feels better about it now and goes back and they have this incredible strategy, this incredible military strategy of blowing trumpets and breaking jars. I mean, there is something about being desperate, being utterly dependent on the Lord that means you're open to crazy. <laughs> you're open to crazy. You're, oh, you're going to like, oh, well, we've got this. I mean, there's 300 of us. For goodness sake, how bad can it get? We're open to crazy. Let's give it a go. Let's, let's bash some jars. Let's blow a few trumpets and shout with all our might, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. God, it works. It creates chaos in the enemy's camp. That unity, that solid purpose, that willingness to do crazy, that willingness to be small yet not give up, worked. Come on, Hope Church. There's a great story arc. We're not done. That willingness to do crazy, the willingness to buy in, willing to shout and do stuff. The enemy is wetting himself if we kind of get to that place. We're already birthing a national movement without trying very hard. I mean, what else could we do? <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? <sighs> nothing, nothing that 
we're done really. Let your feelings about setbacks ignite hunger for change, not put you in a place of resignation. Do not let that. In fact, I'm going to pray that for us in a minute. Don't let that, well, it's just how it's going to be. That's a lie. That's just a fat lie. That's absolutely the devil wants to persuade you to be passive and resigned and hopeless. Let the story, this story, get hold of the one I did on the ark if you're not listening to it, get inside you and become the story for hope and stir your vision and your engagement with it. And let them stir your expectation for your own tangible encounters with the Lord at the start of this year. I am convinced, I'm praying, I'm praying for every single one of you and I've been praying it for a few weeks, we prayed it as elders, this is our prayer for you. One, at the start of this year, in the first few weeks, everybody has a fresh new encounter with the Lord by the Holy Spirit. And I'm, we're laying hands on you, and some of you get in touch already. More is going to gonna happen, right? Two, that you will actually prosper in your life. Your finances, so many of you give generously, give faithfully for so long. It's time to prosper in your life, in your business. We're praying that. Three, praying that you would see someone healed, physically healed, emotionally healed through your life this year. So it's not just you hear about others, although I know many of you have seen someone healed, but this year is going to happen for you again and more. And last is praying that each one of you would lead somebody to Jesus. I read a shocking statistic, it shocked me the other day, about how basically how few believers in their whole life, ever lead someone else to Christ. I'm like, that can't be true, but I think it is. So let's, let's change that. We can do that, can't we? Yeah. We have friends, we have, we have family, we have neighbors, we have work colleagues, we have multiple opportunities out having to go out on the street with Steve singing songs to tell people about Jesus, lay hands on them, whatever. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to do, and highly encourage that as well. What do you think, guys? Are we up for this? Yes, yes. Yeah? Come on, let's stand. I want to pray for anybody in this room and that point about just resignation, about settling, about stuckness. You know it's you. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front or put your hand up. But you know it's you. I want you to tell God that you know it's you right now, please. Be honest with him that you're just like, well, it's just always going to be like this. <clears throat> I'm just going to get on with my life and not have any great expectations. Would you please tell him the truth? <clears throat> he knows, but he doesn't want to play mind reader with you right now today. Holy Spirit, help us engage with you in that place of reality. So I'm praying for you guys that have just said that to Holy Spirit that what's going to happen inside you is that hunger f is going to get ignited instead of resignation there's going to be desire and hunger for things to be different in your present and your future it's not going to be anchored in your past so ignite that Lord in Jesus name I just believe I have authority to do that Right now, so I just break off this spirit. I actually believe it is a spirit. Just take the authority I have in Jesus' name to break off this resignation, this sort of, uh, it's actually a bit icky. It's a demonic discouragement to put a wet blanket, <laughs> a dark cloud, a spot of gloom. I just want to break that off you in Jesus' name. And just that the Holy Spirit would be releasing hunger and passion inside you. And I pray, Lord, that, that these stories would be our story. Well, they are our story. And I pray we buy into the story arc you have for us. Like at a global scale, we win. At a local scale, we win. At a personal scale, we win. And let's buy into your story arc for us. And that they would stir expectation of fresh and tangible encounters 
with the Holy Spirit, which is better than meeting Jesus in the flesh. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit. We're sorry that we've said to you that you're not really as good as Jesus. If only we had Jesus, and yet he gave you to us, saying, you're better for us. Holy Spirit, we're sorry that we've done that, and we welcome you again, your activity in our lives. Amen.